My question is posed to Mr. D'Souza. You'd mentioned that Greenpeace particularly trains its employees in communicating effectively the right photo opportunity, the right place, the right time, and actually to bring out the right kind of issues. Um, how many corporates or organizations in India do that kind of stuff, and including PR agencies? Uh, like I said, uh, you know, Communications is also evolving. I think the first set that you're trying to do is personal credibility. The other set is capability. Capability of us practitioners, capability of spokespeople, of how you kind of evolve. There are some people who are natural spokespersons and have a flair. Uh, and therefore, that is the challenge. You can take the horse to the water, but eventually, if someone doesn't kind of want to drink, then. So, so I think organizations are become cognizant of the fact that NGOs have decided to play the game differently, at least in an organization that I was before. We were very, very cognizant of the kind of games that they were wanting to play, and therefore we would have counter strategies in terms of what are the messaging that we would want to put out. And just to kind of give you an example, I think uh, McDonald's is a classic example of having anticipated this kind of a response. McDonald's the world over is a poster boy to be beaten for obesity. But the way they've actually played the game in India, nobody ever talks of obesity in McDonald's. I mean, that's a fantastic example of what you said, of you know, being a proactive uh, way in terms of how you plan your messaging and reach out to various people. World over, McDonald's and obesity is something that is there. But in India, nobody ever talks about it. So therefore, they've been able to use that strategically. So have, have people been trained? Yes, the, the training has begun. Uh, but are we yet there? I don't think so. I think we still need to, again, please understand we're a very nascent uh, function. As I said, in India, it's evolved post-liberalization 1992. And you're seeing that even in the last six years, you know, the way internet is changing communication. Today, as I mentioned, Google Alert, and you know, you have the Twitter, et cetera. So I think, I think we ourselves are on a learning curve. Uh, but I think if you're cognizant of the fact, if you map out, there are organizations who map out issues proactively and play the game in an engagement format. Uh, if you do that, then yes. So, sorry. Did McDonald's do anything consciously? Yeah, so McDonald's actually had a very selective and a proactive strategy of launching stores, uh, you know, north, south, east, west, and engaging the so-called political fraternities. You look at... In Bombay, for instance, the first store that they actually opened in Bandra, uh, the entire political fraternity, the so-called political uh, activist who would kind of, you know, come out and burn effigies, etc., were managed in the first proactive sense. The second is on pricing. The third is on actually making it part of the business by making it as an Indian menu. So, you know, the various uh, strategy, it was a completely business strategy that was embedded while they were launching into the country because it was a very, so if you kind of say Coke, Coke is giving me red. It's the, fa it's the fa you know, the favorite of, you know, anti-bashing of America. And that's the kind of thing they thought that they would get, but I think they've been successful this far. So, like I said, finally to close, it's no longer about reach and frequency, which the so-called marketeers have been running after today. The world has changed. It is about reach and relationships. And that relationships is what we as communicators should strive to nurture, build, and build a bank to kindly make sure that each of your brands that you handle becomes the world's or India's most admired brand. Questions for Atul. Atul, you know, I would probably, do you handle uh, Tushar Kapoor by any chance? Handle who? Handle who? Tushar Kapoor? No, we don't. Okay. You know what happened on Twitter, right? When he was trending with his picture, which he posed next to a beach, like John Abraham. Yeah, the, yeah. the mob thing. Yeah. What's your, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, do you consider that was at least some kind of PR for him, whether it's good or bad? I would personally never go on Google and search for him. However, in that instance, yeah, I did see the picture. I tweeted about it, and he was trending in India. You know what Oscar Wilde said, na? the only thing worse about not being... Uh, uh, is being spoken about is, is not being spoken about at all. <laughs> so, I, you know, I believe that's true. I think, uh, uh, first of all, you have, you have to see that in the context of the movie that he did, the movie was a spoof and a parody, kind of. It was on brainless comedy. Okay, so they weren't, they were, they were basically saying, get a bag of popcorn, come here, leave your brains behind, we'll entertain you for two and a half hours which is the premise of most movies that make a hundred crores, but that, that is, you know, <laughs> but that is the, the, the reality. So it's not like he was trying to be John Abraham, 
because essentially they were spoofing an iconic shot where John's butt became world famous in India. So uh, his boop. Huh? Yeah, his boop. Yeah, well, you know, he was he was doing that, and then of course I I follow all the comedians on Twitter, including Ramesh Srivats who was here yesterday. I find that a lot. Uh, it's a very it's a very entertaining process. But you know, then you know, once the comics take off on you, then uh, you know that you've arrived. So. Really, I was asking. I was asking him yesterday, how come you haven't made jokes about you know somebody who I thought did make jokes about? He said, well, he's just not important enough. So, you know, so I guess it's a sign. You have to be worried if they don't talk about you. But look, we're talking about him. You know, he's a nice guy. He works hard. He's actually a good actor. If you see him in uh, in a bunch of other movies, this is this movie in the context of where this picture came out is, and we don't manage him, so I can be really objective about this as well. So. What is the approach that you need to take when you are looking at reputation vis-a-vis -vis admiration? So there are certain brands which are and people who are admired but might not have a great reputation. So where do we step in? What is our responsibility? Do we always steer it towards the right reputation? Or are we OK with uh, letting some brands and people take off and be more admired than have a great reputation? What's our role in that process? Uh, Look, I, I find it hard to believe how you can have uh, admiration without reputation. And uh, reputation is an agnostic word. I mean, you can have a good reputation for some people and a neutral reputation for another set of people. So typically what brands tend to do is they tend to target themselves at a particular set of people. So if you take Harley Davidson, you know, since you spoke of the word admiration, or Apple, of course, is much uh, sort of used. If you take Harley Davidson, it doesn't have a great reputation. It doesn't need to have a great reputation with maybe 80% of the audience, you know, uh, younger people, 15, 20, 25 year old. But it has an outstanding reputation for, let's say, anybody who's 40 or 40 plus, because they are the set of people that Harley wants to focus and get admiration of. Therefore, I think brands tend to manage equity or admiration for a set of target audience which is important for them. We, as a detergent, need not manage reputation amongst this audience. But if you go down to villages and smaller towns in India, it does a lot of work to manage reputation. It could be a poster, it could be a wall painting, it could be participation in village arts with the right set of people. So I think, first of all, uh, to your question, managing a positive reputation and getting admiration are both hand in hand. You can't have them at cross purposes. And secondly, you don't need to manage reputation of a brand for the entire set of people. As long as you get it right with the people who matter to you, your stakeholders, your consumers, and your customers, that's that's good enough. Just to add to that, sorry, just to add to that quickly, um, you know, there are brands which are cult brands. OK, so they are already arrived and they are established. So Harley Davidson for one, Zippo for another. These are cult brands, right? So there, you're not even stopping to think reputation in a manner. Reputation, if you really break it down and say, apple to apple, feature to feature, is there a reputation? So Nokia batteries are not doing so well. Motorola phones are not ex extensively good looking. If that is what you are thinking of as reputation, then yes, those elements and those components need to be managed. And that, as a lot of our speakers were saying, is a part of the mapping exercise. But then once you have arrived, and once you are a brand which comes immediately in on the list of top 10 brands, if you are asked to name top 10 brands, then that's a cult brand that's already arrived there. Reputation management is to ensure that nothing drains away from, from you know, the elements that you have already accumulated or the kudos that you have accumulated over the years. Hi, this is Ranjit Nair from Germany. Uh, Atul mentioned that in the case of celebrities, it's easy to, to correct false steps in terms of reputation. And it's, some, it's, it's, it's possible to change the reputation of a celebrity. Uh, do you feel the same thing holds true for corporates? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I handled one of the most loved brands disasters, public disasters that happened in terms of resurrecting the brand and making sure uh, that it actually becomes not only in a sales sense, but also in terms of an admiration tracker. So the moment I joined that company, it was at the worst ebb in terms of a crisis. Uh, having kind of rolled out and my exit from that company, it was ranked number fourth across all sectors in terms of being the most admired. It also had one of the fastest ever sales growth 
uh, ever. So yes, consumers do give you a chance, but I think there is a likability and a favorability quotient. Uh, if they like you, if they favor you, and if you are in their consideration set, yes, they do give you a chance, but it's, damn, it's a lot of hard work, and you have to make sure that you map those who don't want you to succeed. That's most important in life. You know, you have to know who your enemies are and also the kind of whom to play with. And that was the mapping exercise, which is very crucial, and bringing that brand back again into the public glare.